guys, welcome to West Underground, the biggest and baddest podcast in the West. Today we have none other than Cy Home joining us on the couch. Thank you for having me. Oh, no worries, too easy. <laughs> <laughs> having a chat about his musical journey, what he's done, where he's been, and where he's going. Mm. So, let's take it back to the start and tell us what made you interested in music to begin with. Um, well, my dad always had you know, like CDs playing in the car of like you know, Metallica, Guns N' Roses, Van Halen was a big one. Yeah. And um, he just, I think it was just one one day and um, there was a Triple M commercial with Slash on it. Yeah. And I was like, oh, who's that? And my dad's like, oh, that's Slash. And I'm like, oh, he's cool. Yeah. And he plays guitar. I'm like, oh, shit, need to get on it. And then it just went from there really. I just watched a lot of videos and taught myself like just by watching. Yeah. Um, but. So how old were you roughly when Slash? 13, 14 maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was a lot of, there was a, it was a steep learning curve because I kind of I learned the wrong way, like yeah, technique yeah. wise and stuff, because he, he doesn't have good technique, but um, yeah, probably at 14, I think. Yeah. yeah right there. And then you started learning all the Guns N' Roses songs? And yeah. I, I went through like a three year phase of just like playing every album up, up and down. Just, yeah, yeah. Just, just for hours and hours and hours and piss off the neighbors of my parents and myself, but you know, it's, it was, it was good. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Mm. Well, it's definitely a good one. I think, I think when you start, as we were having conversation guys, before we started rolling today, and we we're having a conversation about, you know, 14, 15 being kind of the, the pivotal age mm. when, you, when, when music really takes yeah. a hold on your life. And, um, and I think that, I think if you start playing music at 14, 15 years old, then yeah. You, you get in at the right time. It's a sweet spot because yeah, like, absolutely. Yeah, because you have that you have that drive yeah. if you want something, but it's also like a rebellious thing. Because mm. like my parents were like, you gotta study, man. Like you gotta you gotta yeah, be a doctor yeah. or some shit. And then I'm like, nah. So it, that that was an extra motivation to be like, no, I don't want to do that. Yeah. And I'm gonna I'm just gonna play music until until like one a.m. every night. Did you plug into an amp when you yeah, do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I had like a music room in my house and it's pretty loud to be honest. So the neighbors hate you? Everyone just hated me. Like, <laughs> my mum was like, what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. Like, you're not even good, you know what I mean? But I don't know. You got, I, I've, I've convinced her recently that like, music getting better. It's not just Slash anymore, but yeah, it took a while. Oh, well, that's good to hear. Um, so then, how did you go from going through a kind of a rock phase, going through you know bands like Guns N' Roses, Metallica, Van Halen, so to speak, mm. and then going into the you know the style of music you currently play? I felt I felt like really disassociated with it. Yeah. I don't know, like just because a lot of Guns N' Roses stuff, you know, you you like up the top with the guitar, mm. and then you just play in like like the box, like the yeah. playing box, and I was like, why is that? You know, why can't I expand? And I felt like even with like distortion with guitar stuff, guitar stuff, but like you can really mask up your mistakes with it. Yeah. And I got to a point, it took a while because I was, I was like that till I was like 18, like till yeah, high yeah. school, I was like listening to that kind of stuff. And then I was like, well, that's not good enough for me. And I'm, yeah. I'm like with music, I'm really harsh on myself. I'm like, no, that's not good enough. And I'm like, why am I excusing myself by like covering up my mistakes with all this like noise. Yeah. And I wanted something that was more articulate and clean and you know, a bit more accessible. Yeah. Because I feel like with rock music I had to be in that mood to play. Mm. But lucky I was in that mood all the time. But yeah. with growing up a bit more and you know, going through life stuff, I was like, well, I don't really feel like it. Yeah. So I want to I want to play music that I feel like I listen to all the time. Mm. And uh, that just completely changed that. I don't even have a distortion pedal anymore. You know what I mean? So it's just completely, completely yeah. changed. Yeah. Well, I feel like I feel like rock music is good void for like all your, I don't know, your adolescent uh, yeah. testosterone. And yeah, it's like, like I hate I hate life. You know? Yeah, you just kind of get that frustration out with the world. Yeah. But you know, in, in terms of style now, you're mm. certainly going a more kind of um, how do I phrase this? Um, like a bit of a musical exploration, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, but don't get me wrong, like, if I'm driving down the M1, yeah. doing like 165, <laughs> 110, <laughs> I, I'll be like, I want to listen to some metal, and like yeah, start, yeah. start circle, 
start a circle feed in my car, you know what I mean? Like, there's still that in me. Like, I still yeah, love yeah. the sound of it. But I just don't feel like it's really got my flavour on it, if mm. that makes sense. Like, I don't see myself playing it, but yeah. I just I appreciate it for what it is. Yeah. So. When you when you when you were going through your rock phase, how did you kind of how did you kind of fizzle out of? Did you start listening to like, you know, going back in time? Because I noticed, you know, from my personal experience, it was me kind of going, all right, who was who was Slash listening to, mm -hmm. and then kind of going back to, getting back to you know guys like Jimi Hendrix, yeah, and stuff, and then having that going, oh, okay, Jimi wasn't just a yeah, you know, distorted kind yeah, of yeah, buzzed yeah. out guy. There's also this other side to it, and then you kind of go down that road. Of then John Mayer, yeah, and fighting John Frusante and mm. guys like that that followed along in that tradition. Was yeah. that your journey a little bit there? I definitely traced it back. You know, Slash's big thing was you know Rolling Stones. Yeah, yeah. And like, well, not just Rolling Stones, but there, there's a song called Miss You, but the, like, da -da 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 -da. and that's so funky. You know, it's yeah, like yeah. so like driving down the street kind of thing. And I was like, well, this is this is so cool. Yeah. And then you go from the Stones and you go back to Hendrix. Yeah. And people, like, in my adolescent mindset, I'm still, I'm still young. Yeah. I'm not saying, like, oh, I'm, I'm like an old man. But, like, there was a side of me that was like, oh, Jimi Hendrix, he just distorts everything and, like, plays with his teeth. What's so good about it? Yeah. And that was my closed mind in this. I'll, I'll take that. But, you know, going back and looking at all the riffs he created and how many, like, because every top ten list, like Jimi Hendrix was always number one. Mm. I'm like, why is that? Yeah. And there was a sense of like, well, he's not even that good. But then you, you go back and you look at how many people he's influenced along the way and how big those people are now, like John Mayer. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, like Stevie Ray Vaughan even. Like how influential they've become because of Jimi Hendrix and how influential. It's like this big tree kind of feeling. You know, it's yeah, like, absolutely. Fuck, man. Like, so, so much more rewarding for me yeah because i can just play slash licks until i'm 50 years old but that's not going to get me anywhere yeah. i just want to branch out more and you know i'm not saying like my influence is like really big but if i was ever to inspire people i'd want them to trace back you know what I mean? yeah so, absolutely. so how would you yourself uh sum up or describe your style if somebody asked you on the street hey what kind of music do you play mm -hmm. how would you how would you put it i actually got asked that last night so oh, i've been practicing for this thing. But um, it's it's definitely a lot of synth pop, a lot of new wave, um, like disco, just funk. Um, I feel like if you start playing with a band, it's immediately like rock, but it's not. Yeah. It's like a pop band with like guitars. You just do pop bands like oh, I have a I have a synth player and a really like charismatic singer that's like the brand. Yeah. But it's not like that. It's more. It's more instrumentation that's really, really pleasant on the ears, yeah. in my opinion. Like, people listening right now could be like, what the But, um, you know, like, um, big influences like John Mayer, the 1975, like I said before, um, Harry Styles, even. It's like really. That, and there's like a recurring thing with all those artists that the front man is really just a charismatic and influential. Yeah. presence on what they're doing and that's that's more that's really inspiring like even maybe yeah, even yeah, more yeah. so than the music itself sometimes and, yeah um that's what i've all that's all I've, I've been drawn to for the last couple of years so how did you go from being you know an adolescent playing guitar to then kind of going on the journey of singing um was that a natural progression it was it was unnatural in the way that it was natural yeah. I really was a shy kid in high school. I didn't want to. I was like, I couldn't make eye contact with anyone. I was like, yeah, nice yeah. to meet you. And um, I just wanted to be that guitar player that hid behind his guitar and just, you know, ex express myself through that. But um, we went through countless singers during high school because I wanted to be in a band. Yeah. And it got to a point where I was like, Fuck, I'm going to have to do this myself. Yeah. And that was like when I was, what, 15, 16. 16, 17, or like around year 11, year 12. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, I won't lie, the first performance I did in front of people was like about 400 people. First time singing, and it was shit. Like, absolute shit. Out. Like, it was so bad that I, I like curl up in my sleep, even today, thinking about it. I was like, um, But, and a lot of people wrote me off. Yeah, yeah. Instantly, like, 
you know, because you go to like a school concert, and like kids' parents are talking shit about you. You know what I mean? Like that was like I hear it through people, but like, oh, this person's mum said that was really bad. I'm like, well, thanks for your support, you know. Yeah. And you kind of take that as an incentive, and yeah. to be like, well, fuck you. Well, there's two ways you can go about yeah. it, isn't there? You can either curl up in the little ball and, mm. and do absolutely fuck all and give up, yeah. or you can go, oh my God, okay, that was shit, and I need to get better. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. You know, you know, motivates you to do it. Yeah, and it I obviously won't, has. Yeah, and like, I won't lie, it took, it took a while for me to do that, you know, because yeah. I wanted to be like, because it's my first time singing. Yeah. And like, I'm not sure if you've ever sung before in front of like... No, you know, I've, I've never... I've seen in the shower. I've yeah. sort of sang in front of the guys in it's my band. It's got in the shower. Oh, too. absolutely. It's the only time my voice sounds good. Out there. <laughs> yeah. But like, you know, you, you kind of have your head down, you're kind of nervous. Yeah, like, oh, yeah. Oh, well, well that, that seems like a, you know, in a, in a, in a nutshell, like a bad way to start singing, but has also been a good way for you to start singing. Like, yeah, I mean... Like a bit of baptism by fire. Yeah, there's, there was no initiation. Mm. There was no like preparation. There was no like, oh, you're getting better. It was like, boom, here you go, do what you want. And yeah. then, um, obviously didn't go to play it. But the year after I played, and then all these people that were like, no, nah, you shit, you're like, yeah. you know, that's really nice. I'm like, well, thanks for the support. Yeah. Um, and it's just been a natural thing since then. And there was times where I was disassociated with playing guitar. I was like, I don't want to be a guitar player. Ooh. Yeah, that's coming through. We've got the ice cream truck. Like. Yeah, we've got the ice cream truck coming in the back, guys. If you're just tuning in now, Mr. Whippy's, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Whippy's coming. I remember running down the street with the, you know, the heart-shaped ice cream? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, was, that was the shit, I mean, yeah, oh. like two bucks. I remember, I... <laughs> I remember when ice cream was, you know, exciting when Mr. Whippy would come and you'd hear that noise yeah. and you'd want to run out of your house. Yeah. But now... I think kids don't do that these days. No. That's because the drivers are so whack. Yeah, exactly. They're just what so sort creepy. What kind of drives an ice cream truck? Yeah, like, what kind of person do you have to be to drive Ooh. those things? You know? It's like, here, here, kids. It's like the stereotype, like, yeah. free candy on a white van. You know? Oh, exactly. And even, like, now, like, when you hear the ice cream music, I think just because of the association with it in horror movies and stuff like that, it just feels <laughs> creepy. Like, surely they can get a better song than that to yeah. make people go ice cream. Right. So, Wait, are we still live right now? <laughs> anyway, getting back getting back to the music now since Mr. Mr. Whippy is my <laughs> Um So, so what are... What um, kind of directed you towards towards including synths in music? Um, it might have a relevance to Mr. Whippy actually. Just how bad it sounded. <laughs> like you know, like eighties, eighties synth pop. Yeah. How sh like the synths are so shit. Yeah. But in the best way. Yeah. And I was like, oh, if I just added like if I was just playing guitar music, like you know, two guitars, bass, drums, vocals, yeah. and I added like a really bad synth on it, like it just sounds a bit more. Contemporary, in a way that it's just like a throwback, but it's like modern. You know, yeah. like even you see now, like The Weeknd or like yeah, Julie, yeah. but they're all going back to the eighties with like mm. that funk and disco and synthwave stuff. And the thing that I think really sells those kinds of the, those songs, that, yeah. that sh like the Blinding Light song, that da, 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 yeah, yeah. that's not a good sounding synth, but but it sounds so good in the, like in in the weirdest context, way, yeah. you know, and. Like, even if I sampled Mr. Whippy, like that truck that would just drove past, like, if I sampled that and put it under, like, a really clean sounding drum or something like that, it would sound really cool, in my opinion. So that was. Because I, I li listen to, like, a lot of. Not a lot, but, like, electronic music, because there's only so far a guitar can go. Yeah. You know, you, know, you have your typical rock band with, you know, bass, drums, guitar. There's, there's only so much you can do. Yeah. Um, so that's why, even with our band now, we've added a synth player who plays saxophone just for the variety. And that's really why we started adding that kind of stuff in our song. Yeah. Well, I think I think once you start adding different instrumentation, you start to open lots of doors. Mm. Mm. Like like we, you know, even when we're talking about all these kind of you know the the quintessential rock bands. Like all of, after a while, well, I think all those guys kind of get bored with where where they're kind of boxed in, and you you listen to David Bowie's progression yeah. throughout throughout his career, and you you like how did you end up here? Yeah, 
but I think it's just because he's just searching for different sounds, yeah. as you say, in the guitar, you know, they kind of go so go so far yeah. before before you need something else to kind yeah. of to, to break it up. So in in your I don't know when you play live, um, do you play any synth parts yourself, or do you have do you have got do you have a little band that? Um, I'm not. I'm pretty uncoordinated. Yeah. <laughs> So like singing and playing guitar is like hard enough for me. Yeah. I can <laughs> so if I had a keyboard there, which I'm not like I'm not really too familiar with, and I start like trying, I feel like yeah. I put too much pressure on myself. So that's why we've got a synth player. But I'm really particular with the sounds that he plays because he has like a Nord, yeah, so he can yeah, like yeah, kind yeah. of do whatever he wants. But um, yeah, I I'm more of a I think being disassociated with playing keys helps me list be a better listener. Yeah. So, because if I was just like a guitar player, I, I could, I would have like more of a, a structured mindset of what sounded good and what sounded bad. But like, if it was like, if because I don't play keys, I can hear something that he's playing and be like, I really like that. But sometimes his reaction is like, oh no. But I'm like, I really like it. Yeah, yeah. And it just creates a contrast to you know just being a really strict guitar player yeah. in terms of sound and like gear. And yeah, even with yourself as a guitar player, do you do you find your you know do you find yourself getting lost in the in the world of pedals and effects? The only way I justify it is I cannot have a pedal sitting there mm. that I don't use. Yeah. So if I spend copious amounts of like money on it, I'd be like, well, I have to use it now. Yeah. And and there's definitely an element of playing with the gear more than playing with the guitar. Oh, absolutely. And it's easy to get lost in that. But. Yeah. It's an investment, I guess. You, you keep it there forever, and it's gonna it's gonna be a part of your career, career yeah, yeah. for however long you need it to be. So uh, that's how I justify with that stuff. Oh, absolutely, I'm too scared to go down the pedal rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. Like I've got a, I've got a couple here and there, but they they're mainly like um, like drives or other drives mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Because I'm too scared to buy the delay, because then I then I buy the reverb, and then then I feel like I'm gonna just throw out you know money left, right, and center. Yeah, that's where I remember. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, another, another question that I wanted to ask, which, just because your tattoos are just so interesting, I just want to hear a little bit about it. Because mm. um, I see a Pokemon around the corner. Yeah. It's could we get could we get some cameras on the tattoos? Is that possible? Oh no. Squeak, squeak. So I've got. Um, there, there, I've got a few here as well. Um, oh. Where do I start? Like some of them are for shits. Like where did you stuff? Like where uh, you this was my first one. one. This, this one here, it was like a box. And looking back now, I don't know why I got it. Yeah, yeah. We have to start somewhere. But um, this is a Harry Styles tattoo. <laughs> Not even a joke. Um, he played a show in Sydney, and he had like this tour intro before he came on, mm. like this visual, and it was yeah. like him in a Rubik's cube. So yeah. Just sort of like. I was in the, I was there in, ah, uh, he played in Brisbane, and I went to Sydney and Brisbane, and I went to Brisbane, and I just got the, that done there, you know, it's... Does anybody else know that? Like, has anybody else seen that and be like, oh... No, nah, that's the sad thing, I'm like, oh. come on, man, I thought you, I thought, like, I thought Harry Styles fans were, like, die hard. Yeah, yeah. And then I show them this, and they're like, what's that? <laughs> you know? <laughs> but, um... Uh, there's some sentimental ones, obviously. Um, the, this one, especially. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a dragonfly one, cause um, friends passing. Yeah, yeah. So that that's um, that's there. Uh, this butterfly one doesn't mean anything. Yeah, that looks um, cool. You know, it's just kind of like the centerpiece of my arm. You know. Yeah. yeah. If I had muscles. Yeah. It'll kind of go go like all all wonky. Um, I've got a matching tattoo with a friend's ghost. The shit. Yeah. Um, got two Bring Me The Horizon tattoos, have you, Bring yeah, Me The Horizon? Yeah, yeah. And Bring Me The Horizon was so influential in me, like, cause, with me, because um, they got flamed by fans because they kept progressing their sound, and it was the same way with me in terms of, like, how could you expect someone to be the same that they are 10 years ago? Exactly. Like, I feel so, so different to me a year, like, six months ago. Yeah. Like you, you look back at a photo of yourself from like a while back. You're like, who is that guy? Mm -hmm. And how could you like? My thing is, how could you expect someone to be the same? Like, just because, like, I understand like fans. They listen to a song and they attach themselves to the music and they feel like it's their own. Yeah. And yeah. then once the band tries to take that away from them, they feel like you know, 
a bit, a bit, you know, a bit shit about it. But, like, the fact that they got flamed so hard, but they kept going with it, and they were like, I don't, I don't really care what you think, because this is what we want to do. That yeah. was the most, that was really inspiring. And so I've got like a, there's a song called Throne, which is literally about that. And then I've got, they put out a record last, two years ago, called Ammo. Yeah. They got that last year. And then I've got um, three up here. This one is bullshit, I don't know why I got it. This one's kind of bullshit, but it kind of looks cool. It does look cool. Um, I bled for four hours. And they're like, do you want a break? I'm like, yeah, no, just do it, hurry up. Yeah, yeah. Stop, stop, stop asking me, I'm fine. And then um, I've got Lavender Chandelier, which is one of my newer songs. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I got that there because I thought it that was all right. That was cool as well. Yeah, um, I'm glad they spelled it right. Because <laughs> um, we, we've all heard, the, heard those stories, but... No records. Yeah, no, yeah, no records. <laughs> I should have got that instead. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's mainly what yeah. these things are. But. Do you reckon you fill it in? Can you feel it in as a whole yeah, yeah. I just it's just every time I've had I've been like every time I'm broke I'm like oh when I get money I'm gonna fill these in and I'm gonna fill my armor. Yeah, yeah. And, I'm, and then as soon as I get money I'm like oh pedals. Yeah. You know, so it's like <laughs> you know. Well, don't rush to do it. Yeah. Because uh, I suppose over your life it'll be it'll yeah. be your story. And they don't really I don't know I don't really think about them at all. Yeah. They're kind of just there now. And yeah. Especially during the winter, you know, you kind of wear long sleeves all the time. You don't even. Like realize that they're there, that they're there, you know. Yeah. And then, oh, it's like, oh, I got that. Uh, <laughs> cool, man. But yeah, they're just there. I don't, I don't put that much meaning on. Which one was the most painful one you got? Um, this one. So if you, if we, if we have a look on the camera here, um, these black bits. So this went for about three hours. And two of those hours was them, or that person, like scraping my skin, like blacking it out. That's why I have so much respect for people that have like blacked out arms oh, or like those kind of things. Yeah. Because you just feel your skin going back and forth. And it's not just like a thin needle, they like yeah, scrape yeah. it over and over. And I was watching it the whole time. Is, is it painful the whole time or after a while it starts to become alright and you can just tolerate it? At the start, at the first the first five minutes you're like, I don't think I'm gonna make it. I don't think I'm gonna be able to sit here. Yeah. And then it kinda of numbs out, but it's still like a throbbing like if you've ever had sunburn and you like scraped it. It's like that the whole time. Yeah. Um, but then it's done and it kind of, you don't have to do it again. So, but then you just want more and then you kind of forget about the pain, which is pretty <laughs> stupid. But um, yeah, that's, that was probably the most painful. Or the one here, right in the middle. Like, I, I thought that might be the most painful. Yeah, like it's got shading there so they yeah, scrape yeah, the skin yeah. again. Why do I do this? <laughs> it's just, uh, yeah. Other than more tattoos, what can we expect in the future from you? Um, I've got a few songs written. Just with COVID, you kind of get in a rabbit hole of writing a lot. Yeah. And you kind of have to like push yourself away from it and be like, is this even good? Yeah. And there's been a lot of songs that I haven't made the cut, you know, like, yeah. I've been, there was a time. Do you during, finish every song that you do? No. No. I, if I hear something that will make it last, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll keep working on it. But if it's like a spur of the moment, t midnight, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. like a minute long song and it's, and I wake up the next morning, listen to it. I'm like, well, this is shit. Yeah. Then I won't bother. But, um, oh, it's nice to have like as a reference to go back to. Yeah. Like, oh, you know, that's, that was, that wasn't that bad. Or, yeah. Um, but I've got a few songs that I really like actually. And, um, yeah, so it's just a matter of like when to put them out. Yeah. Um, kind of like slowly introduce them to people. Because we, we played a show, what, four, like three weeks ago at Lazy Bones? Lazy Bones Lounge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and we played one of the new songs and people were like, oh, what's that song? You know, like, when are you going to put that out? So it's just a matter of like building hype, not just through social media. Yeah, absolutely. But it's kind of hard now because that's the only thing you've kind of got. Yeah. Um, so it's just a matter of like strategic, strategically... <laughs> Strategically planning, st st how? St uh, yeah, of how to put it out in the best way, yeah, and getting the most people to like listen to it, and that's that's probably the hardest bit for, for us now, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So when you going back to writing songs, what's your process? Do you do you come up with melody and then try to fit it around, in like guitar parts? Or um, it's it always or? different. Yeah. Sometimes I'll have like a cool name, like this Lavender Chandelier, I was like, oh, that'd be a cool name for a song. 
and then you just try to bait, you know, yeah. and write it around that. And I made this like instrumental, and I yeah. sang over it. Um, I have a song called uh, Artisan. It's like a guitar bit I had for two years. Yeah. I was like, oh, I'm never gonna finish this song, and then I was like, I'm gonna sit down and write it, and then it came about. Um, sometimes I write lyrics in my head, and I'm like, oh, and it's like a real perfect match. Of, like you have this instrumental, and you have these lyrics, and they just fit together sometimes. Yeah. Um, it's always different. I've never, never tried to structure it because I feel like I'd limit myself too much if I did that. Yeah. Because um, yeah, if I had like this cool mel melody, I'd be like, no, 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 I have to make the music first. And then that, mo that moment's gone. So yeah. it's about capturing the moment when you have it because they don't come very often. Yeah. yeah. Do, you have a, do you have a phone full of like, I don't know, 10 second recording, 20 second recording? Yeah, I'm not, not like going to play them. No. <laughs> it's, more, it's more like uh, 9 a.m. in the morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, you know? I think everybody who's a musician out there can relate a bit to that and mm. having like just endless amounts of like snippets of recordings mm. on their phones. Yeah. Or like three sentence lyrics. Or yeah, yeah. Do you ever go back and then turn one of those ideas into something and then like listen to, I don't know, a bunch of those recordings and kind of go, oh. Like, it's hard to listen to. It's yeah. hard to listen to. But there have been some times where I recorded like a guitar bit on my phone mm. and like a year later I just went through because I was like, I want to hate myself today. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, that's not bad. And yeah, then it came yeah, a song. Yeah. So there's been times like that. Yeah. It's weird when you talk to people because everybody seems to have a different kind of process for doing it. Mm. And it's, it, I always find it weird, the guys who write the lyrics first. Like, because I, 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 I find that bizarre. I'm like, mm. like I, I, for me, I can't get my head around. I can see how somebody's kind of got a melody idea mm. of where they want to go with it. And then you kind of put lyrics yeah, to that. Yeah. But doing it the other way around always seems like absolutely bizarre to me mm. I, I will say that when I write lyrics first the lyrics are always more more important to me not in terms of like oh I'm if I have a song that's an instrumental and it's like catchy or something yeah and the lyrics are made a little less um, but I had a song called what like, flowers in the hair or something and that was all lyrics first yeah and they were like the most meaningful things I've written compared to, you know, a good beat or something, and then I'll just like write a catchy melody over it. So there, there, is, a, there is a reward for writing lyrics first, but it just doesn't happen, happen that often for me. That's just how it is for me. Yeah, nice. And um, have you got any gigs coming up? Next Saturday. I'm not sure when this is going out. Well, this is coming out, this is coming out in, in the next week, so. September 12th, um, Frida's Chippendale. We're playing two sets because the venues, they need people to come, but they can't have over like 50 people in the one sitting. What time? Uh, there's two sets, 6 to 8, and then 8.30 to 10.30. We're playing at 7 and 9.30, but with two different support bands. So that'd be pretty cool. Hopefully people will tickets. Hopefully they do. Hopefully. Hopefully. Mm. Well, I think people have been locked up for a while now. Yeah. You know, I think everybody's got a bit of a new yeah. thing to want to go outside. Because even with our Lazy Bones one, that sold out. Yeah. We only had like two weeks to promote it. But people were just like so desperate to go somewhere. Mm. Which, um, which, which is kind of sad. I mean, like, you could come to want to watch me, but like, I, I understand. But there are, there, I have a few people that will always come. Yeah. And I'm really appreciative of that. And then you've got people that were like, oh, you know, we'll, we'll start the night there and go off. Yeah. Kind of. Well, some of those people that, you know, might just be at the venue because of, you know, Lazy Bones is a cool place to hang out. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Lazy Bones. But, you know, then they might then they might see you and one more. Yeah, and they might, yeah. But, yeah. so, just putting yourself out there. Yeah. And yeah. just being, giving yourself as much opportunity as possible to be recognised. Yeah. That's, that's like, probably the biggest problem with COVID. Yeah. Because you can live stream a set for two hours, but no one's going to fucking watch it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. realistically, no one's going to sit there and be like, oh yeah, I'm going to sit here for two hours, watch my phone. I'm going to, I'm going to get a mess, I'm going to get a text from someone halfway through and be like, oh, you got a new dog or something, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. it's just not realistic. So, to sit, to have a gig and be lucky enough for people to come is something I always appreciate. Mm. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think the gigs where people are already at are better than the ones that the gigs where you're expected to bring people. Yeah. I 
think I think the gigs where you already have you know kind of an attentive audience mm. waiting or you know just people at a cool space is is a much better audience than the mm. one where you have to yeah and we're, we've I say we because we do it as a band I do everything yeah, myself yeah, yeah. but then we play as a band um, we've been doing that for t two three years of trying to convince people yeah and it's slowly 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 getting to a point where people will always the, the people that will always come will come yeah and because they want to be there yeah and whether that whether that's five ten fifty people you just you just have to take the time to be like thank you and not just like a thanks thanks for coming you know oh nice to see you. it's like fucking thanks man thanks yeah. for coming and it's a really hum it's a real humbling thing no matter even if it's one person or 50 yeah and it's good i think i think a lot of up and coming artists me included have just got to take the time to appreciate that oh 100 yeah. percent. and um any any uh any further words any anything you would like to add before we start wrapping it up um gee I think I've put you on the spot here. Yeah, I mean, come to my show. So this is going on Thursday next, or well, next week. Yeah, yeah. So if you see this, you have two days to get a ticket. Um, Fifteen dollars, but like, hopefully it's worth it for you. Um, we're playing hopefully in November as well. Yeah. At the Factory Theatre, but we're playing a, f a small, small room, mm -hmm. but we're trying to get it upgraded to the main stage. Yeah. So, like with, with um, Reese last night. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, like they'll be playing. Um, so, if you are interested, please come on to that as well. Um, yeah. the, I'm planning on putting out a few songs before the end of the year. So, that's also something to keep. Well, that's exciting. Mm. Yeah. And uh, any, any advice for musicians out there that are watching that are, that are just kids at the moment, that, are, that are, want, want to start a career in music, what would you tell them? Um, what would you tell your younger self? What would I tell me? Oh, just turn the game down, man. Just turn, turn the, the turn the distortion <laughs> off, bro. Um, convert to Fender earlier. That's what I'd probably say. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Stop playing Gibsons. But um, probably just don't be so disheartened by one comment. Mm. Um, because like the more popularity you get, the more people that hate you. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying, oh, I'm so popular, you know, like, mm -hmm. I look at me, you know, take a picture. But, you know, there will be people that are, out, that are out there like, oh, I don't really like this. Yeah. And you can take that as, oh, like, when I was younger and a bit more immature, I was like, oh, they don't like me. Mm -hmm. But it's more of a just, like, you know, I go through my phone, I'm like, I don't like this song, it's the same thing. Yeah. And, it's, you know, but once it's your own thing, you're like, oh, that really hurt. So it's just being... I think, Resilient a little bit. Yeah, yeah and yeah. being a bit more empathetic because, like, you can kind of say something really snarky, really slide to someone about the music that they listen to. But then, if you imagine that being your own song, you're like, even, even something like a song that comes on the radio, you can, you can say, oh, this is shit, but would you, like, you don't really know how much time has been put into that? Yeah. Yeah, so that's probably. Well, I'd recommend. Yeah. Anyway, well, that I think that's I think that's really good advice, actually. Hey, I think hey, that's yeah, I think I think out of you know many people that we've had on the couch so far, I think that's some of the the wisest words we've heard. Oh, no. <laughs> I'll take that. Thank you. Anyway, thank you for coming on today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. Thank you. Wait to see this acoustic set. Oh, I'm so keen. Pressure's on. Oh, bro. Yeah.